Okay. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the next session. And the next session is about open source software for MIDI 2.0. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Me, and we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Um, so it's really good to see you all here. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, this topic is about open source and why it's important to MIDI 2. So uh, what I'm going to do first off is before we go too far is I'm going to do introductions and then everyone can say who they are. Pete, do you want to go first? Sure, thanks. Is this on? Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so hi, my name is Pete Brown. I'm from Microsoft and I lead the Windows MIDI Services open source uh, inbox API project at Microsoft. I am Michael Lowe. I'm with Aminote, and uh, we've uh, been contributing what we can for open source uh, MIDI association, along with a driver from Microsoft and or for Microsoft, uh, but also uh, other elements that you'll come to hear. Uh. Does this work? Okay. Hello, my name is Franz Dietro. I'm a principal engineer at Native Instruments. Uh, as a tech lead being responsible for our hardware and software technology stack, including MIDI, including USB, plug -in formats, and so on. And uh, yeah, I'm busy, very busy in the MIDI association and uh, contribute to the standards. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Andrew Mee. I am the MIDI Association Developer Support Working Group Chair. I'm currently a consultant to Yamaha, and I want to be very clear when I say that, that my opinions about open source represent my own personal opinions and not Yamaha's. Um, and I work on quite a fair few open source projects within the MIDI, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and one of the big things is that we're trying to really encourage everybody here to um, get involved. So without further ado, um, can we show the slides please for a second? So what I want to go through quickly before we start talking about open source and why we're doing it and how that's going to really benefit the uh, industry, I first want to just say we have lots of open source right now. So we really want to encourage everyone to use it and we'll go into why, but just what's out there is really kind of important. So just quickly what, we, what I want to really highlight is to talk about the fact that we have uh, two of the op operating systems have actually open sourced their actual MIDI 2 implementations. This includes obviously Windows, which Pete did a great talk about earlier, and we've been hearing lots about open source during the day. And obviously Linux being an open source environment, they've got all of their code available in open source within the ULSA libraries and also within the kernel. Uh, as far as applications, we're still early days. There is the uh, MIDI 2 workbench, which we've talked about some of, I've talked to some of you about this in the past, but really this is a, uh, a testing and compliance tool that uh, we encourage everyone to use when they're implementing MIDI 2 to make sure that they're doing the right thing the, and doing it the right way. And it's also really helpful for developers to speed up their development. Other libraries, I'm not going to go too much into this, but these are ones that are actually provided by members of the MIDI Association. And um, if you're interested in all of these stuff, I can make sure you've got links after the actual presentation. So don't stress too much about trying to copy it all down now. Um, but these are the your low level libraries that can help you actually do your development within your applications or embedded devices or whatever you're feeling like at the moment. Um, we're also talking about we also have things to do with USB, which is really important because at the moment the bunt transport that we do have is the uh, USB MIDI 2 transport. And it's kind of very important to make sure, again, USB can be really difficult to get right, so we're trying to provide as much help for that as possible. All right, so first I'm going to hand over to everyone else here. Now that we've done a sort of brief overview of all what's available, we certainly didn't get you capture all of the different open source tools that are available, but and there's more of a, more around. Um, so if we've missed you, it's no insult, it's just purely that we haven't got there. So Pete, we'll start with you. We want you to describe the open source project that you're working on and why you're working on it. Okay. Uh, so our, I, I acted surprised, like I was expecting you to ask that question. but. Uh, so our project's a little bit different here, I think, than, than some of the other things you're talking about, where we're not necessarily making 
uh, reusable libraries that everybody will be able to use on whatever they want. Instead, it's we have built our MIDI implementation all the way from the driver through the API as open source, even though it's going to be uh, inbox and Windows. Um, we're actually using some of the other open source products that are here as well. Uh, actually, your library for doing translation from MIDI 1 to MIDI 2, we have that uh, code uh, in the service and I believe in the driver as well. Uh, and um, really, our, our, our intention behind this originally when we started it was we wanted to make sure, one, that everybody could see what we were doing. Um, people would not have a black box for MIDI that they just had to accept the way it works on Windows. We wanted them to be able to look at it, to debug it, to tell us where we screwed up, you know, to make changes, to, to help make the MIDI system better for everybody. Uh, but another reason was, and it was just so funny because the ALSA folks moved amazingly fast uh, and it ended up not being an issue. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the Linux folks also could see another open source unencumbered implementation that they could compare against. Um, but the also folks, like I said, are so efficient, they just blazed ahead and got it done anyway. Um, so really, it's, it's kind of a new thing for us at Microsoft. We're not used to having our APIs in Windows as open source. So there's a bit of a growing pain that we've had for how we move things internally versus how we have things externally because there are some processes that are still only supported if you build internal in Windows, like the way we do code signing and the way we do trusted installers and a bunch of other stuff. That all has to happen from inside. So we're working on better processes for developing in the open, which we've been doing, and ingesting internally so that we can create the builds that go out of Windows and so that uh, everybody, well, you know, uh, it doesn't get lost. We still have all the same stuff that we had on GitHub. Um, so it's been a great learning experience for us. Uh, we've had a ton of good feedback from the folks at, uh, at Ame, the different uh, Japanese companies. And I should mention that one of the things here, uh, and I know I talked about it this morning, but our USB audio, uh, excuse me, our USB MIDI class two driver is one of the open source items here. And that's actually been funded by Ame. So thank you, Ame, for that. Uh, and they agreed to have it be open source as well. So there are other companies involved in this that have been actively contributing to this. Uh, and that's the driver that uh, is being written by Amino. So I think that covers it all. Yeah? Yes, so uh, I, I really uh, like supporting uh, open source mainly because uh, the way I look at it is we, our, our products are the products that you're making. Your, your unique part is not what's conforming to the specifications or the, or the standards that are written. So let's all make that better together. So I wanted to make sure that we provided a way for everybody to uh, work off the same platform and work together and just create the best we can. Uh, and it started for us with a product called Protozoa. It's a hardware prototyping tool, uh, hardware prototyping tool for uh, MIDI 2.0. Uh, it brought in basically the first USB MIDI 2.0 device. Uh, and those drivers are available open source on MIDI2.dev. In fact, all the source for Protozoa is going to be available on MIDI2.dev uh, in fairly short order. Uh, we're just going to get those all launched. But that's that's the start of you know a hardware device that people can use and cater to their needs to develop with. It also helped. Uh, it, this has happened a few times where someone's found a problem like an AME member uh, with a driver, for example, and to us to reproduce it is very difficult, but since we all have protozoas, they sent me an image based on protozoa, and I was able to reproduce their problem. That's all because of open source. So it, it, I think it's really really a good way to go. Um, so yeah, uh, Amino's contributing, of course, the protozoa code, but also we've contributed the uh, USB uh, embedded USB drivers for MIDI 2.0, which is backwards compatible to MIDI 1.0. And uh, we're also going to be working with uh, companies like Kissbox, uh, Ben Wass, uh, got some stuff in there for future stuff. Uh, I guess we're gonna talk more about that later, but the networking and so forth, we're gonna contribute to that and that as well. Uh, but yeah, we're keeping fa fairly active in the open source space for embedded side mainly. Yeah, 
I'm uh, the author of NI MIDI 2, which is a modern C++ 70 library implementing uh, the whole specification UMP 1.1 and uh, all of MIDI CI. This library is in fact already a production ready library. It's used in a number of products, including the complete control hardware you can see there on our booths. And uh, yeah, this, this, this library is, is really targeting to be on the one hand, really high quality with a high quality standard, a lot of unit testing, 100% test coverage. And uh, it also uh, tries to um, give a unified view to MIDI 1 and MIDI 2 protocol and enable you as an application developer to deal both MIDI 1 and MIDI 2 protocol within the same code branch. So you don't need to have two different code branches where you handle MIDI 1, MIDI 2 channel voice messages. We have abstractions for controller values, for pitch, for pitch band. And this together with a unified API allows you to something like, hey, let's look, ah, this is a node on message. I don't care whether this is a node on on MIDI 1 or MIDI 2. Give me the node number, give me the pitch, let's go. So it's a really easy way for you as an application developer to, to turn your code into MIDI 2 very, very easily. Yeah, and... Uh, Additionally, I also uh, contributed a little bit to Protozoa. So there's also a show codes available in Protozoa. You might see then uh, later if it is when it is released. There is a free Atos implementation using NIMIDI2 to showcase a lot of different transports. And yeah, I also uh, contributed to uh, the driver, the, the tiny USB driver, not the not Windows driver, which we also developed uh, for the Protozoa. Yeah, I pass it to. So. Um I tend to work on a few different projects. Uh, most of my open source side of things is working on the MIDI workbench, which is fan fantastically funded by Yamaha, who allows me to spend time on it. Um, but the whole point of this was that we really wanted a tool in the MIDI association that we can make sure that we can prototype against and work on. And it's for a long time, it's been actually sitting in the in, in for MIDI association members only. But we also wanted to make sure that media association members could use it without actually any concerns. So we kept it as sort of open source, but only within the media association for a long time until we kind of refined it to make sure that it was actually working correctly. But it's very important to make sure that we test all the specifications and work on that. So we really tried to make it a cross-platform, that it works with all the different USB stacks as they go through, and finding problems and making sure that we can actually get those solutions. And it's been really good because, again, it's open source, so lots of people come back and say, oh, this is wrong, here's a bit of extra code. We've recently released that to the public, um, and we encourage everyone to use it, but it's been really good because I've actually had a whole bunch of people who are, I've, I've never heard of before or they're outside the media association who have come forward and said, hey, you've got this bit wrong or I'm not getting this stuff correct. Um, but I think it's also in that model it actually works out very well because it's not an actual product for sale. It's not intended for that. It's intended as, it, as an application. It's really intended to be a support tool for the industry. Um, I also work on a small C++ library. I think we've all had similar ideas about doing that. Um, I started doing a lot of work on small Arduinos to try and test MIDI, MIDI 2, um, mainly because I wanted, really wanted to prove that the device, that, that small chips and small, small microprocessors could actually cope with MIDI 2. And they can, they do it, can do it very well. Um, but it was also really important for me to have that, put it together, work on that, and to make sure that uh, that the messages are correct and they, they actually are handled correctly. So I do that. Um, I obviously contri contribute to other other uh, open source projects as well. We all work in together. And then last but not least, one of the other things I'm working on, and this was a bit of a side project, was a USB descriptor builder um, because we were all doing lots and lots of different USB designs and trying to get USB descriptors to be correct is an exercise in uh, frustration, so it's just a very simple tool that you can go online, fill out some details, it automatically fills it all out for you so you don't have to try and uh, second guess or get... And we also made sure that that was going to generate the right USB descriptors for um, every operating system because 
some are a lot more strict than others and so we want to make sure that when you're developing you're not sitting there suddenly going oh uh, this works in, in uh, on Windows but not Mac or vice versa or works on you know all these things these are really important things to, to have and to make sure that the actual industry as a whole actually uh, makes uh, you know can can produce these things quite easily uh, because the time the, the other big thing is the factor is to try and time to reduce of development and I think that that's really important um, all right we should go to the next slide um, I think we might have actually covered some of this so this is I don't know if anyone's got any extra points about this but we really wanted to ask why did you decide to go with open source and uh, why does that matter with MIDI 2 I think we might have covered it but if you've got extra points let's go for it so one of the things that I thought was a, a real benefit for MIDI Association and open source is if you if you even look back at the history with say USB MIDI 1.0 there's so many different interpretations of that specification and implementation. And by going open source and then us all working on it together, it's that consistency and we all try to make it the same and better together, basically. Um, so I thought that's a big part of this, uh, why I wanted open source, why I wanted to drive it myself, but of course the Media Association as well. It's that making us all implement it the same way and if there's something wrong, we all fix it together. Does anyone else have anything else they want to say? Yeah, um, I, I'm a fan of open source since, since the very beginning. I was already, already active in the, in the very early Linux uh, development staff and, and uh, learned the, the concept and the ideas. And at Native Instruments, we are using open source from, from the very beginning of our software development. and. Uh, I believe that, that it's really important that, that you share code and that you also give back to the community, yeah, right? Uh, so uh, we as uh, the music industry, we have very special knowledge which we can share also with others and enable then others to make great products uh, using the open source. Yeah, and especially with MIDI too, uh, this, this might be yeah, very relevant because already MIDI 1 wasn't that easy. But it was relatively small, and people made the same errors over and over again, right? When they started getting into MIDI, and and it's really beneficial then for for newcomers and also for for everybody in the industry if you contribute and and collaborate on the same source code and try to use the same fundamental libraries and frameworks to implement the bread and butter stuff that you need to have in your in your software, and then you can probably better concentrate on your product features instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to ensure that you are compatible to other media software or hardware. Uh, one last thing I want to say on this is if you think about MIDI itself, MIDI, it's, MIDI, if you go back for a long time, has really promoted the idea of sharing. So it's actually, you know, here's the specifications, they're out for everyone to use. There's no lic licensing so much as just to go and actually say, go use this MIDI go implement it in your products and I think it actually is very uh, tied into the essence of what open source is which is the whole concept of sharing so I think in that respect I think open source and MIDI actually makes a lot of sense yeah, there's also another aspect of this because uh, if you have open source for people they, where they can look into you you also have an alternative version of the specification so the specification is really dry and, and very technical and if you have the source code and, and the implementations, you, you might better understand, hey, okay, this is what they thought, how this should work. Yeah, that's great, because you have this APIs, you have this implementation, you have examples, and I think it's all a really good for, for education in, in the media area to have larger open source projects that are developed by people who are really know what media is about. All right, um, I think, we, again, this is, topics we may have already covered but I do think if anyone here might want to say something about this about why commercial products should actually use open source code as opposed to reinventing the wheel um, and uh, what would you like to see your particular open source code used for? Well again ours, ours is a little different here so I'll, I'll be super quick but uh, we're hoping that people can look at our code can learn from it especially when you were talking about the, the dry specifications. I'm hoping I'm saying this loud enough so Mike can hear us say dry specifications. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
<laughs> yeah. I, I want to I wanna make sure that people can see that things like the USB MIDI 2.0 specification is already kind of old, and there are a lot of decisions that the different operating system companies made together where we all agreed we're going to treat this particular part of the specification in this way through the MIDI association is how we did that. You wouldn't necessarily know that unless you have some code you can look at, but luckily the ALSA implementation is open source and the Microsoft implementation is open source, so you can learn from that when you're building a device, be like, oh, this is why my descriptors don't work. Also, because I didn't use Andrew's tool to build my descriptors. But you'll get an idea of like what, what kind of assumptions are being built in. Also, we want pull requests and bugs. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, it, as a community, you know, we can all work together on improving these things. So if you find something wrong, regardless if it's in the, in the OS side of things or even on the embedded side, we can all work together to fix it. And that's, that's I think, really big. And as, as Franz, uh, Franz was saying, why spend the time on trying to interpret the spec and get it implemented, grab it from the open source so you can spend the time on making great products? That's what we all want to do. So. The only last thing I'll say about this is if you do actually use the open source contributions from, from any of us, please feed that back. Even if you don't have any issues, please let us know that we're actually, that people like it, people are using it, and that it's in a product. Because it's good, it's, it's, it's good karma, it feels nice that you've actually done something that someone's going to use. Um, it, it's very good, a good feeling to know that someone's used that and it doesn't matter if it's sold, you know, 200 units or 200,000 units, which would be great for everyone, but it would be really good to know that it's actually there. Last question, future, 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 um, uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to predict the future. What open source code product or application would you like to see in the future? So, uh, I actually led into this before, but uh, definitely this uh, effort that we're doing for Network MIDI, uh, yeah, with the new MIDI, MIDI specifications being launched, I'm very much looking forward to launching the contributions on that and making more contributions. Uh, Benoit from Kissbox has already put his library into, uh, this is a plug for MIDI2.dev, so we're all talking about this open source. MIDI2.dev is our decided location to put all this. So if you guys want to come in to MIDI2.dev, you can see what we've got published to date, you can see what's coming. Uh, we welcome others to join us on there. But yeah, when it comes time, turning on that network MIDI, I think that's going to be fantastic. Look forward to that. Uh, specifically, the part that I'm adding to what uh, Benoit had put in from Kissbox, uh, I added in uh, to use lightweight IP and free RTOS uh, as the uh, base base for running the, uh, the, the, the protocol. And uh, that's actually what I have running inside our Mitosis products if you wanted to see that uh, on uh, on uh, Network Mini. So. Yeah, honestly, I, I have no idea what idea, what, what, what product I would like to see, but I would laugh if we enable with our open source the, the real MIDI 2 killer application in the market and we have contributed to this. This, this would, would be really, really great. Yeah, I'm going to second I'm going to second Franz on this one. I think we've actually, well, lots of different people have provided open source libraries. I think now's the time to actually see those turn into applications. And it's there, and I would love to see, uh, I've already started to see, we've, as I said, we've got a whole wall of some of these things, and they're using open source libraries in them, some of them which are great. I think it's going to be really good when we see things like people utilize the high resolution, people utilize MIDI CI, and just make everything so much more simple uh, for the users and the musicians. And I, that's what I really want to see the open source libraries used for. And I think we will see that, but I re that's, that's, that's the bit that I'm, I'm you know, really holding, holding out to see, and I think that that's going to be very exciting. Um, I think that's the, sort of the end of our questions there. So we're going to leave it open for anyone who wants to ask any questions. Um, we really welcome any, anything at all you would like to, to, to ask on this.
somebody has a question, I'm happy to bring the mic to where you are. I'm going to go there first. <laughs> Hello. Hey, um, do you guys have any suggestions, like, for people who, like, I'm not, I don't do coding, but I am interested in tinkering around with MIDI. Is there any, like, uh, crypt products, like, DAWs or software or like I know some of the Korg stuff has 2.0 implemented like what what's some stuff that we can play with to like help make bug reports and sort of just experience where MIDI 2.0 is at right now uh, well let me talk about some of the things that, that I'm involved in there. yeah sure uh, if you if you want to learn some of the, the MIDI 2.0 stuff on Windows uh, our we have developer builds right now of our MIDI stack that's going to be released this year okay and we make it so that we have built-in loopback endpoints because we know there aren't very many uh, uh, MIDI 2.0 devices out there. So we have these software devices inside Windows that you can talk to and you can send messages back and forth so that you can learn how to code that. Uh, in addition to that, we do have a number of MIDI 2.0 devices that are here and are available. Yeah. Uh, Roland has some. Um, uh, we have uh, the Native Instruments uh, keyboard over here. We have a uh, chord keyboard at the top as well. So they're out there. And then we also have, well, I'll leave for you to talk about your stuff. So. Yeah, uh, that's actually kind of the, the intent of Protozoa, right? Uh, the Protozoa is actually based on the Ras Raspberry Pico. So when this code is published for you guys, uh, which is very soon, uh, on mini2.dev, uh, you'll be able to grab it, and for four dollars, you can go buy a Pico, and you've got yourself a, a USB MIDI 2 device, and uh, you can cater it to what you wanted to do. Of course, we wouldn't mind if you get yourself a Protozoa. The, so the advantage of the Protozoa is we've implemented some some buttons and knobs and so forth on it, uh, as long as MIDI DIN that and we you know, supply that translation code, but also it allows you to debug your what we're calling the unit under test um, through uh, IDE in live in real time. So you, you can plug plug into the one one device with the USB and open a debug session to look at your code as you're going through. So, but uh, all that's available, open source. For, yeah. It's $4 for Raspberry Pico. So, yeah. Okay, great, we have another question over here. Hey, thanks for this. It's really fun to hear all this. Uh, can you say anything about the compatibility with Bluetooth MIDI, uh, with uh, MIDI 2.0, and are you at all optimistic about either Bluetooth or any other wireless MIDI being viable for live performance in the future with less latency? Yes. So, uh, in terms of Bluetooth MIDI, it's not. It's people within the association have talked about it. Um, the, there is a. A sort of a, a conversation that says yes we need to do Bluetooth MIDI 2 uh, we are looking for people within the association who want to get that working group together and actually working on that so if you want to get onto that I would absolutely suggest joining the working groups and pushing for that um, in terms of transports as well um, so one of the big things is obviously networking what we're we've kind of demonstrating here we've been showing this on on uh, Ethernet but obviously the idea is to work on Wi-Fi as well and to make sure that that's reasonably reliable on that. So yes, in terms of wireless transmission, that'd be the one to go with that. But Bluetooth is on the on the radar at some point, but that's a no, no promise land. Yeah, I, I actually spoke to a gentleman uh, whose name is Chia, like the, <laughs> which is unfortunate for him. Uh, but uh, he, um, he used to work for Kurzweil. He now works for a company in China. And he is very interested in doing uh, a Bluetooth MIDI, so he actually suggested that we open a Bluetooth working group, uh, and so I'll put you put him in touch with the working transport group. Yep. Hey, uh, one comment, one question. Uh, the comment, one thing that you omitted, um, the elephant that's not in the room. Obviously, Juice is supporting in Juice Seven MIDI CI currently. Open source, if you're a non-commercial product, UMP support coming in Juice 8 someday, maybe. Um, question is, one thing you didn't talk about is open source licensing. Um, what kind of permissive licenses are you using? Are they guaranteed to be compatible within the MIDI2.dev community? And what else do we need to know? Do you want to do that? Or? So, 
So we encourage from 82.dev anything you contributed is based on uh, MIT license, uh, just because it's the most per permissive. Um, we will take others, but we're really encouraging MIT. One of the early conversations we had, because there was some code that the, the folks here wanted me to look at for some different stuff, and it originally wasn't licensed as MIT, it was GPL. I actually can't look at GPL code uh, because that it's, I don't want to say it pollutes, but it does sort of, it gets in your head and then there's always a chance that maybe you've used something from GPL, et cetera. So we just generally have a policy that if it's GPL, I don't look at it. Um, and so we tried to make sure that everything here is uh, as permissive as possible. No funky licenses, just straight up MIT. Any other questions? If not, up, oh, John. So I'm wondering what role JavaScript, particularly the most recent uh, incarnations of JavaScript, are playing in the MIDI 2.0 ecosystem. I'll, I'll, I'll do that one. Uh, so in terms of JavaScript, um, I'll have to say that, um, so if you're talking about uh, Web MIDI 2, or you're talking about Web MIDI, or you're talking about, okay, so Web MIDI at the moment, um, is, is a different organization, it's all done by W3C. Uh, we would love to see, I think we'd all love to see Web, Web MIDI 2.0. There's got to be someone who's going to take have to take that to W3C and actually push for it. There's some discussion already kind of started, I believe. Um, but, uh, so MIDI CI will work quite happily over Web MIDI 1, that's not a problem. Um, and I originally did some original testing with that. The workbench itself is actually written in um, Electron, which is JavaScript. The libraries in that are not really extractable at this point. That's something I'd love to do and have this time to spend on so that people who are building applications in JavaScript can use all of that and it's just there and it's a fairly complete library. Um, but if you want to talk about that a bit more. Well, no, not, no I don't want to talk about Electron. <laughs> no, we're being but uh, talk to Chris Wilson at Google. Uh, he's the one that, uh, we've been having a conversation about Web MIDI 2.0 and being like, hey, somebody needs to start up that, that process. And I think he's looking for more people to help share the load on that. So there is a need for a kind of lingua franca uh, as a vehicle for expressing you know, something one level lower than specific, or platform specific implementations. And JavaScript could function that way because it executes both in a server uh, environment and, and in, a, in a client environment. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, well, there's a need for a kind of um, lingua franca for at least expressing notation uh, algorithms in a platform independent way. So we don't have this explosion of Tower of Babel of uh, a dozen different platform specific implementations that are very costly to um, uh, to maintain. So I, I think John just uh, volunteered to join the MIDI Association as a member and start a working group on this topic. Um, I, I, I think we are probably going to have to close it out at this point to get ready for the next uh, session. Um, but I do want to do this QR code that will take you to MIDI2.dev. So just scan it, take a picture of it, take it home, share it with your friends. Uh, give it as a gift for the next Christmas. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. And uh, I want to thank all of the people, not only for being on the panel, but doing all the work to do the code and contribute it so you can all be successful. Thanks, guys. Thank you.